of the suggestions that you make around what individuals can do is to be driving less. Um, but Australia is a very big country, and so what does it mean for us mm. in such a big mm. country to drive less? How can mm. we do that? Mm. So in my experience, having lived in, um, in Brisbane for several years, it is quite doable to get around by public transport and riding. So for me, I, I take most trips, say, under 10 kilometres by bike, and I find that quite enjoyable. It's a nice way to stay fit. And public transport actually works pretty well for longer distance, um, above 10 kilometres. In fact, um, we've taken many holidays by public transport as well. We recently um, went to Burley Heads, catching the train and bus, and um, a couple of years ago we went up to the Great Barrier Reef even catching a, a long distance train and then a bus and a ferry. So you can, many people who own cars and use them extensively might be surprised at how far you can get using bikes and public transport. I get your point though that Australia is a big country and um, for, particularly for people in rural areas where public transport isn't as accessible, it might be difficult. So we're not saying in our book that everybody needs to give up their cars. What we are saying is try to reduce your car use as much as possible. So. Um, there are other ways for commuting, um, uh, you can, for short trips to the shop, you might be able to walk or ride your bike. So everybody can do their own bit. We're not saying everybody needs to give up their, their car. It's for some people, like for me, it's quite doable to live life without a car. If that's for you too, that's great. If not, that's okay too. It's just, it's about us doing what we can to contribute to solving this problem. Tom, in um, your chapter on low carbon diets, do we really have to go vegan? Yes and no, Penny. So animal agriculture is a big part of, of the climate change problem. M many estimates would suggest around 20% of emissions are caused by animal agriculture. And um, more broadly than that, um, farming of cattle and sheep and pigs and so forth use a lot of land because a lot of um, crops are grown to, to feed to animals, especially in Western countries, and it uses a lot of water as well. So it is a big issue environmentally and also from a human rights perspective actually because um, about 10, 10 billion people could be fed with the amount of grain that we grow in the world today. But that's, so that's two and a half billion more than we actually have on, on, on the earth. But yet people still go hungry and that's partially because so much grain is fed to animals. So I think, yes, we do need to curb our consumption of, of animal products, of meat and dairy and eggs. Um, However, I realise that it's not viable for everybody to go vegan. I, I tried going vegan for a month or two and I really missed yogurt and cheese, I must confess. <laughs> and um, also it may, makes it harder for people to cater to me um, because you know, many, many meals that people prepare have some cheese in it or desserts or you know, have some ice cream, that sort of thing. So what I've done in my life, um, which isn't, isn't what everybody should do by any means, but I've, I'm, I'm a vegetarian and I try to keep my consumption of milk and eggs low, um, but I'm not, I'm not a strict vegan. I'm happy to eat milk and eggs when that's kind of socially required or when I feel the need to. <laughs> so I think everybody can work this out for themselves to, to just take a step or two along the continuum from kind of eating meat three meals a day and um, uh, towards um, being a vegetarian or a vegan. Anyone can take a step or two along that continuum to do their bit to contribute to lowering their carbon footprint. Not necessary for everybody to go vegan, but yes, we do all need to reduce our consumption of, of animal products. So another thing that um, produces a lot of emissions is mm. flying. Mm. And um, we live in a globalised world where a lot of people are required to fly. and. Your family yeah. um, included have flown back and forth from India mm. to Australia. Mm. So, how do you yeah, come to terms with that? Yeah, another really good question, Penny, and one I, I think about quite a bit. <laughs> so it's one of the few regrets I have about my cross-cultural upbringing. It's been fantastic in so many ways to have friends in India and Australia, to see the differences and the similarities between cultures. Um, but it's one of my few regrets that it's required flying between them several times. For me, personally, what I do is when I need to fly between India and Australia, I try to spend enough time in Australia or India to really reconnect well with friends there, do what I want to do, so I don't take short trips. If I'm going to spend all that carbon and money getting to somewhere, I want to spend enough time to really savour that experience. So that means for me, I don't take, um, I don't fly for, to go for holidays, because holidays are great, but um, they're short, short experiences and I, I just can't feel justified for myself spending that much carbon on just having fun. Uh, 
um, for, for a short period of time. So, and I would encourage many, all of you, um, <laughs> there's, there are great holiday spots within Australia or, or within whatever country you're living in. Um, so we, we really have really enjoyed going camping and stuff in, in spots nearby where we live, both in, in Australia and India. Overall, with flights similar to the other things, I realise people's circumstances differ. Um, for some people, flying is more necessary part of life. For other people, it's, it's easier to give up flying. Again, like with the other things, I'd say just do, do what you can, keeping in mind the, the seriousness of climate change. Now, Mark, you suggest in your book that a sustainable level of emissions is two tonnes of carbon dioxide per person per year. Mm. Yet Australians currently emit 23 tonnes per person. Mm. Mm. You don't think it's asking too much for Australians to cut their emissions by 90%? It is a pretty shocking statistic, isn't it? And we were amazed when we found out that uh, you know, sustainable level of carbon dioxide emissions, two tonnes, average Australian, 23 tonnes. It's just incredible to think about. And it's, it's interesting that very few people are telling us those things. Um, so, yeah, I guess short answer is we realise that that's a, that's a huge ask and it, it's probably not doable for most people. But as Tom said, uh, what we're asking for is for people to think about climate change, to think about their lifestyle and how it's affecting that and take a couple of steps along the continuum to reduce their carbon footprint. So, you know, if that means, hey, next year we, it, it's 20 tonnes and not 23 tonnes and, and in five years' time it's down to 15 tonnes, then that's great. Um, and there's relatively easy ways that we can do that. You know, so even if we just, um, instead of eating meat five times a week, we eat it twice a week or instead of driving to work five days a week, we do it only three times a week. Things like that, there's relatively easy things that we can do. So no, we don't want to put the heavy on people and say, you've got to cut your carbon footprint by 90%. But we, we are saying, please think about your carbon footprint and take steps to um, reduce it where you can. So you're not expecting us all to go and live in the slum, are you? Um, and so, you know, do you have any suggestions about how we can live a low carbon life but still have a high quality life? It's a good point and it's certainly we've been careful in the book not to kind of glorify poverty because poverty is, is a very very difficult thing. A lot of our friends and neighbours in, uh, in India have very very difficult lives. You know they can't access the health care they need, they can't access good education for their kids. So we're not espousing poverty that's for sure. But we are saying there are things that we can do in, in our lives to lower our carbon footprint and still have a very very high quality of life. And one of the best examples of that is, uh, is the consumption of things. Um, so, you know, we, we continue to buy things thinking that it's going to make us happy and content and so forth, but it, often they don't. You know, we might get pleasure out of this new thing for a couple of weeks or a month or so forth, but then it, then it dies off. What I think our friends in, in India have taught us and that we've learned ourselves from all of those years that it's that the other things in life that you can't purchase and don't require a carbon footprint like um, enjoying nature you know, or just a little bit of peace and quiet or enjoying a good piece of music or enjoying the ocean or enjoying our friends and family. None of those things require a carbon footprint but they're all really important to our quality of life.